from Georgia Public Broadcasting, this is Battleground Ballot Box. I'm Stephen Fowler. The slate of candidates for Georgia's 2022 general election is almost set with a few notable exceptions. Crowded Democratic fields for key statewide races like Secretary of State and Lieutenant Governor have led to June runoffs with high stakes. The reason why a portion of Republican voters believe that the election was stolen in 2020 is because Republican leadership enabled this to happen. But not everyone showed up to important debates. Kwanzaa Hall is a former member of the Atlanta City Council and represented Georgia's 5th Congressional District. He never responded to our invitation to join us today and is represented by an empty podium. Meanwhile, Republican runoff debates for congressional seats turned like ugly. His county commission. Yes or no, did he get elected as a Democrat? And then Jimmy Carter helped him see the light, and he started the Butts County Republican Party. Jimmy Carter, Party. the biggest Democrat. There. And candidates made their pitch about why they should move on to the general election. America's in trouble. You do have a clear choice. When you're in trouble, can you turn to a Marine or an ER doc or to a slick, fake politician? This week, we look at Georgia's primary runoffs. It seems like it's always election season in Georgia and that the 2020 election cycle never quite ended before 2022 began. In many ways, that's true. Candidates are still making false claims about the election system. Donald Trump's endorsements still hang over the outcomes and national attention seems permanently affixed on the peach state. After the dust settled on the May 24th primary election, there are still some races left to be decided. Georgia law requires a candidate to get more than 50% of the votes in a race to be declared the winner. Otherwise, the top two vote-getters head to a runoff. A new Georgia law also shortens that runoff period to just four weeks after the first round of voting instead of nine. So we're already halfway to June 21st. The Atlanta Press Club, in conjunction with Georgia Public Broadcasting, hosted a number of runoff debates this week to help voters better understand their choices in a number of races, ranging from the Democratic bid for Secretary of State to several competitive Republican congressional contests. In the newly drawn 6th Congressional District, frontrunner Rich McCormick and Trump-endorsed Jake Evans battled over who could be the most conservative. This is exactly what you get with a failed politician who's been running for 38 consecutive months and bought out by liberal special interests. I view this race as very serious. We are in a serious state of affairs in our country. We have to elect bold, unafraid conservatives that aren't compromised and cannot be trusted by the people. Evans said McCormick, who narrowly lost the 7th Congressional District in 2020 to Democrat Carolyn Bordeaux, was merely pretending to be a conservative because he received support from groups like the American Medical Association. McCormick is an ER doctor. Meanwhile, McCormick said Evans had flip-flopped on support for Donald Trump and used a law review article Evans wrote several years ago to imply he did not support law enforcement. We are sick of fake politicians will do or say anything to get elected. Fake politicians like Jake Evans. This is a guy who said he backs our police, but writes a manifesto about defunding them because they're racist. He says he's for religious freedom, but then cheers when the religious liberty bill is defeated. He's on record trashing President Trump, praising Abrams and Pelosi, and advocating for troops in Ukraine, and then denies it. These are his words, not mine. Both candidates have pushed false and misleading claims about Georgia's elections, and both agree on many issues. McCormick said he would support a total abortion ban with no exceptions, while Evans said only if the life of the mother is in jeopardy should it be potentially allowed. There was some substantive debate, too. McCormick said the current Democratic administration's plan for prescription drug pricing was not enough to lower costs. When it comes to making drugs and and pricing protections, we have a big problem. We have a middleman problem, too. That's where the big part of inflation is happening in in medical health care costs. We need pricing transparency across the board, including with health care centers, with the access to medicine. And and there's a ton of things we could do, but we need to, first of all, defeat the things that aren't working that Biden and Pelosi have instituted. The next debate wasn't much more civil. Trucking executive Mike Collins had the most votes in the first round of Georgia's 10th Congressional District Republican race, and Trump-endorsed Vernon Jones finished second. Much of the debate interestingly revolved around the two ultra-conservative candidates accusing each other of being Democrats and not really pro-Trump. 
Jones brought up Collins's dad, former Congressman Mac Collins, who started his political career as a Democrat before spending decades with the GOP, and also accused Collins of asking for Democratic votes the last time he ran for Congress. He mailed to mailers to Democrats, telling Democrats to cross over and vote in, in the Republican primary. Now, this is factual. It was reported by the AJC, it was reported by radio stations, it was reported widely because he is a rhino and he needed Democrats to help him get elected. If you want to run as a Democrat, I would suggest my friend run as a Democrat, not as a Republican. Collins denied those claims, pointed out his dad's long Republican credentials, and hit back by pointing out that Jones, who switched political parties in January of 2021, was a longtime Democratic lawmaker and CEO of DeKalb County, one of the most Democratic parts of the state. Mr. Jones, I really, I, I don't have another question for Vernon Jones other than the fact that he has spent his entire life as a, as a Democrat. His entire life has been a corrupt career politician. Both candidates fall on the end of the conservative spectrum closer to controversial figures like Trump, Matt Gates, and Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Both have campaigns centered around bashing liberals, championing Trump's policies, and calling out the more moderate wing of the party. And both are fighting hard for this runoff, since the district is so heavily Republican that the winner this month is all but guaranteed to win in November. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Battleground Ballot Box from Georgia Public Broadcasting. I'm Stephen Fowler, and we're talking about Democrats and Republicans in primary runoff debates this week. The final congressional primary runoff debate that aired Monday is important in its own right, too. That's Georgia's second congressional district, where Republicans Jeremy Hunt and Chris West are hoping they can ride a national wave and unseat longtime incumbent Democrat Sanford Bishop. I know I'm the only candidate in this race who can defeat Sanford Bishop once and for all. 30 years of Sanford Bishop, this Democrat incumbent who's been in office, who has not done anything for our district. We need somebody who's going to be engaged in beating Sanford Bishop and working hard to do that. But the focus of this debate was more on who knew the district enough to best represent it in the race against Bishop. West, an attorney with multi-generational ties to Southwest Georgia, said Hunt wasn't from the district, pointed out most of Hunt's fundraising came from outside of the district, and suggested his background wouldn't resonate enough with voters in the district. I'd just like for you to uh, demonstrate to the audience that you do in fact know this district and tell us which three counties that Jakin the city of Jakin lies in, the city of Brenton lies in, and the city of Mock. What counties are those? Hunt, for his part, was not deterred. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Well, I'm, I'm happy you brought those up because I don't think you visited any of them. And I'm thankful that I won 22 of 30 counties in the primary, and I came in second in the remaining eight. While Sanford Bishop has comfortably won re-election for several years now, a tough environment for Democrats plus formidable challengers have some people thinking he could be vulnerable. Regardless of the outcome of that race, how both parties approach campaigning in the Southwest Georgia district could have an outsized effect on how the statewide elections end up. Another race where a fall opponent loomed large over the debate is the Democratic Secretary of State contest, where incumbent Republican Brad Raffensperger's name was uttered more than once every 60 seconds. The reason why a portion of Republican voters believe that the election was stolen in 2020 is because Republican leadership enabled this to happen. We currently have a secretary of state who upheld the law, but he's running his campaign based on conspiracy theories. State Representative B. Wynn came into the runoff with the most votes, but former State Representative D. Dawkins Hagler had a strong showing in South Georgia. Brad Raffensperger, one of the reasons why he defended the voting machines and the integrity of the vote is because he hired some of his friends to do that job. And so he didn't want to have egg on his face either in the position of the Secretary of State, bringing them on with the uh, Dominion machines, as well as the, the people saying that those uh, results were not accurate. Both called out Raffensperger for his calls to stop non-citizens from voting, even though there's no evidence it's happening and it's already illegal, and offered nearly identical responses to most policy issues, including why they think Georgia's election laws need to be changed. 
Brad Ravensburger is not a friend to our democracy. In addition to backing Senate Bill 202, the 98-page voter suppression bill that criminalizes handing out a bottle of water to voters waiting in line, he recently came out and stated he wants to end automatic voter registration. He supports ending no-excuse absentee ballot voting. And it is important for us to tell Georgia voters exactly who Brad Raffensperger is, and he is not a friend to our democracy. There was a little more contrast in the Democratic debates for lieutenant governor and insurance commissioner, if only because candidates failed to show up. Charlie Bailey, the 2018 nominee for attorney general, eviscerated an empty lectern representing former Atlanta City Council member Kwanzaa Hall. My question is, why did you do that, Mr. Hall? Why did you take that money illegally? Why did you compare yourself to a rape victim when you were caught? And why do you have so little respect for the voters of this state? Now, he can't answer that question because he's not here. Uh, but I would say him not being here is also a pattern. And Janice Laws Robinson had the stage to herself after Raphael Baker declined to show up for the insurance commissioner debate. If Mr. Baker were here, I would ask him, what are your plans for this office? However, the empty podium says it all. He does not take this position seriously, and he has no plans for Georgians. He is not showing up for a debate, and he will not show up for you. The final debate of the day saw two Democratic candidates share their vision for what the state's Labor Department should do after the pandemic exposed major issues with how unemployment benefits were handled. Nicole Horn. We are still waiting four to six months for people to, on average to receive their unemployment benefits. Part of this is a people problem. We're completely understaffed at the Department of Labor. Only 4% of phone calls are answered. That's unacceptable. There are also broken processes there. 80% of people who apply for unemployment are initially turned down. And State Representative William Bodie. This Department of Labor was never set up to handle claims on a daily basis without a pandemic or economic recession. So we need to staff up. Also, we need to modernize the technology as well. So I'll make sure that we have the best staff. The winner of that runoff will go on to face State Senator Bruce Thompson in the fall. There are several bigger picture items to look at with this runoff beyond who wins or loses. On the Republican side, will Trump's influence carry two people to Congress in a low turnout race? For Democrats, will endorsements by Stacey Abrams secure the rest of the general election slate? And what happens if her hand-picked candidates lose? From an election administration standpoint, how does conducting a runoff so soon after the general election impact procedures like early voting, absentee ballot processing, and certification? We'll keep track of all of these and more in the coming weeks as we head towards the November 2022 midterms. Battleground Ballot Box from Georgia Public Broadcasting is produced by me, Stephen Fowler. Our editor is Josephine Bennett, our engineer is Jake Cook, and Jesse Neiswanger wrote our theme music. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you get podcasts. Thanks for listening.